What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. Hey everybody, welcome back to DaVinci Cases. Sorry it's been a little while. Uh, I've been on call a good amount over the last month or so, so it's been hard to uh, do some of these cases, but I uh, appreciate you guys bearing with us, and we got a nice case for you here today. Also, if you haven't checked out the Da Vinci Hour podcast, which is my other podcast, uh, we're interview style, long form. I uh, had some great guests recently, Mark Cuban, I uh, had Gary Michelson, who's a, a billionaire surgeon, physician, inventor uh, with nine, over 900 patents that was just released uh, recently. We had a vent physician turned venture capitalist on, a number of other uh, subspecialist interviews as well. Uh, so definitely check those out. All right, so for this case, we've got a 23-year-old male, so a fairly young guy here, presenting to the emergency room uh, with fatigue, weight loss, and frequent episodes of bloody diarrhea with abdominal pain that has increased in frequency and severity over the past three months. So this is more of a kind of subacute presentation. It's not super chronic where it's been going on for you know over a year or multiple years. But this is definitely something he's been dealing with uh, for a significant period of time. Three months is no brief period, that's for sure. It's getting worse. And so definitely when you see this, especially in these young patients like this, you want to immediately think about inflammatory bowel disease. You know, unfortunately, the incidence of colon cancer is getting younger and younger. Um, and so you always want to keep that in mind. But typically, that's more people maybe in their 30s or early or mid 30s or their 40s. It certainly can happen in people in their 20s, especially if they have certain genetic syndromes, uh, but not, not quite as likely, but definitely keep in the back of your mind. So his vitals in the ER are 38 degrees Celsius, heart, so he's febrile, his heart rate is 81, so he's within normal limits, his blood pressure is 124 over 81, so that's normal. Respiration rate is 16 per minute, and his O2 sat is 98%. So he is febrile. So now that he's coming in with bloody diarrhea, he's got abdominal pain. You could also think of, you know, maybe he's got some kind of infective colitis going on in, in uh, infectious colitis going on in his colon. Uh, so you definitely want to be uh, concerned for that as well. And whenever there's blood, you always want to be, you know, possibly concerned for a GI bleed as well. Uh, but again, that's one where you kind of have to look at uh, the trend in, in hemoglobin and things like that. Physical exam is known is notable for tenderness over the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. So he's got white, right lower quadrant pain. He's coming in with kind of generalized abdominal pain, and then on, a, on exam, it's localized to the right lower quadrant. Obviously, you want to be worried about appendicitis, especially in you know uh, younger individuals like this. It's fairly common, so that you know you can, you can consider as well. He he does have a fever. His labs are notable for a hemoglobin of 8 grams per deciliter. Normal is 14 to 17 for males. So eight, he's definitely anemic. Now, the fact that he's hemodynamically stable suggests that he probably isn't rapidly bleeding out right now. doesn't mean he doesn't have a GI bleed, but it means that he, that he is at least stable for right now. It also could be, you know, this is these episodes of bloody diarrhea have been going on for a significant period of time. So it could also be the fact uh, due to that, that he's chronically over time losing, you know, losing blood. Also, his white blood cell count is 17,000. Normal is 5,000 to 10,000. So he's definitely got an elevated white count, suggesting some type of infectious process going on here. So we hit a CT abdomen pelvis. This is going to show us a lot. So it reveals bowel wall thickening and enhancement of the ileum and the cecum. And what I can tell you with that, that when you see that on imaging, it means that the bowel is inflamed. It means that there's some kind of inflammatory process going on. Now, it could be a wide array of things. It could be infection. It could be inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, which certainly would be possible in a patient this young. And so you definitely want to uh, keep those in mind as well. He also has an adjacent small abscess. So there's no mention of specifically the appendix being inflamed or anything like that. You can have abscesses with, with really bad appendicitis, but there's no mention of it on imaging. So I think we can pretty safely rule out uh, that this patient has appendicitis, and it looks like more like we're looking at an inflammatory bowel uh, process going on here. 
The patient is taken for a colonoscopy, which reveals multiple discontinuous mucosal ulcers in the cecum and the terminal ileum. So these are important words we'll get into in a second. Now the question is, the patient most likely has a deficiency of which of the following? Vitamin A, vitamin B9, vitamin B12, and vitamin E. So let's summarize these findings here. We've got a young man presenting with fatigue, weight loss, and progressively more frequent episodes of bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. His vitals are notable for fever, otherwise he's hemodynamically stable. He's got right lower quadrant tenderness on exam. His labs demonstrate anemia and elevated uh, white, white blood cell count, suggesting some type of infectious process, which we end up finding on imaging. And imaging shows us inflammation of the ileum and cecum with an adjacent abscess. So this is very suspicious for inflammatory bowel disease. Right lower quadrant, you remember the ileum and the cecum are in the right lower quadrant, so that would make sense that that's where the focus of his pain is. And then he gets a colonoscopy, and it shows that there's an inflammatory process occurring in the cecum and the ileum. These are discontinuous muco mucosal ulcers. So that's actually classic for Crohn's disease, and we'll go through Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis here in a minute. Now, with the thing with Crohn's is these are discontinuous ulcerative, uh, you know, inflammatory processes that happen really anywhere in the GI tract from, you know, the mouth all the way down to the anus. And so they're discontinuous and they can cause severe inflammation, obviously. And then they typically happen, they can happen anywhere, but their most common areas are actually the ileum and the cecum. And so what happens is that when you inflame, you know, the ileum and the cecum and the small and large bowel is you affect absorption because that's the main function. And so by doing that, you affect specifically in the ileum of all these answer choices, the right answer is vitamin B12 because B12 is absorbed in the ileum. And this is a classic question that they love to ask on pathology exams, on the USMLE. So you definitely want to keep this in mind. You definitely want to know what's absorbed in each aspect of the GI tract. The duodenum is obviously the major absorption site, but the ileum has some interesting ones. B12 is absorbed there. Bile is reabsorbed there. Um, so you definitely want to keep that in mind. And so again, this is complicated by an abscess, which is very common in Crohn's disease. Unfortunately, they can get uh, be complicated by abscesses. We'll go over the complications here in a minute. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break from the case right now to let you know that DaVinci Cases is brought to you by DaVinci Academy, which provides online video courses for the medical basic sciences. These courses are taught using a variety of teaching methods, including bullet point outlines, diagrams, radiology images, and chalk talks to explain the fundamental concepts. We then teach the application of those concepts to numerous clinical pearls that are frequently tested on medical school exams and the USMLE. Our video courses are available on our website, dviacademy.com, as monthly subscriptions starting at $9.99 per month. Each video course has a corresponding outline format textbook as well. You can find the link to our website in the description below. Also be sure to use the discount code DC20 to receive 20% off any of our video courses. Now back to the case. So first, ulcerative colitis. This is a continuous ulcerative inflammation affecting the mucosa and submucosa layers of the colon. So if we look here on this diagram of the GI tract, you, know, you have the small intestine centrally, and then you have the colon that kind of wraps around peripherally. This only happens in the colon. Ulcerative colitis, think about it, it's in the name, col, meaning colon. It cannot happen anywhere else. It's not going to happen in the small intestine. It's not going to happen in the esophagus, the stomach, nowhere else. It's only going to happen in the colon. And it actually usually begins in the rectum, and so it begins more in the you know most distal aspects. But then it can it actually goes retrograde. It continuous it goes continuously proximally through the colon. So these are continuous ulcers versus discontinuous, which you see in Crohn's disease. And the pathogenesis of this is still under uh, quite a bit of research. But what the thought is is that colonic epithelial cells are destroyed by immune mediated attack that involve cytotoxic T cells. So as a result, the colon is unable to effectively reabsorb water, and this leads to patients presenting with diarrhea. Now, as a part of destroying these cells, you get cellular debris and some blood products that are released in the intestinal lumen, and that contributes to the bloody stool as well. So patients with ulcerative colitis can also present with bloody stool. So patient coming in with frequent episodes of bloody diarrhea does not actually help you with differentiating Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. It just, it just tips you off that you want to consider both of those on your differential. Patients will present with abdominal pain often in the left lower quadrant because it's starting down here in the rectum and continuing up this way. But again, they can present with other areas of abdominal pain. If it's progressed to the point where it's over here, you could, they could also have more generalized or right-sided abdo uh, abdominal pain, and then frequent episodes of bloody diarrhea. Genetic predisposition, you know, obviously if patients have a family history, you know, their parents had this or something like that, or they have a sibling with it. Also, 
more frequent in women, so young women, teens to 30s, also more common in uh, Caucasians. So this is kind of just a diagram histologically. So, you know, you have your GI epithelium here. So this is your mucosa here. Then you have your submucosa layer, your muscularis externa, and then the serosa. So this is the whole wall of the GI tract. And then out here, obviously, is the lumen. So what happens is, is you have these ulcers that form, and then they actually only go to the submucosa layer. So this is important because sometimes tests will ask about this, is it will affect the mucosa and the submucosa. And then what happens is, is it continues in the colon, it continues proximally. So it starts in the rectum more distally and then continues uh, up through, you know, the descending transverse and ascending colon and so, and so on. And so it continues this way. And so it's just a continuous extension of that original ulcer. The way you diagnose ulcerative colitis definitively is by colonoscopy. They say imaging, but you can't really definitively diagnose it. It's, it you have to biopsy the tissue to actually see what's going on. Imaging is really good for seeing complications of, of ulcerative colitis. That's more the bigger reason. As you saw with our patient, and it's the same thing with Crohn's. Um, as you saw with our patient, you saw they had an abscess that had Crohn's. So in that, for you do you CT or MRI. Treatment, you can do a, a wide array depending on the symptoms. So if it's more mild symptoms, you can do anti-inflammatory medications like sulfsalazine and mesalamine. If they're more severe symptoms, you can do immunosuppressive therapy like corticosteroids. You can also use biologics as well, like these immunotherapies here. And then if it's really bad, you can actually consider doing a total colectomy where you just remove the entire colon. And actually that is curative in a high percentage of cases. It's actually pretty good. But you have the, the problem is you have to weigh you know, the downside, the comorbidities of the patient living without a colon. So that's kind of a, you know, something, a decision that the, the doctor and the patient need to make. Complications, you can have very severe bleeding, toxic megacolon, bowel rupture, and then colorectal cancer. So if we go to Crohn's disease, these are discontinuous transmural inflammatory lesions. Transmural means that it occurs through the entire wall of the GI tract. So we'll show you a diagram of that in a second. Lesions that occur anywhere throughout the GI tract. So you have all the way up here in the oral cavity, going through the esophagus, the stomach, you know, small and large bowel, and down to the rectum and anus. And then anywhere along this tract, you can have Crohn's disease. And the other thing is you can have discontinuous. So you can have it, you know, some in the colon here, and then you can have some in the small bowel. A common scenario is where you have some in the ileum and in the colon, like is what, what we see with our patient. The mechanism is unclear, but it's thought to start with a defect in the GI epithelial barrier, which allows pathogens to migrate past the epithelium and into the GI wall. This obviously triggers an immune system activation via antigen presentation. You have subsequent uncontrolled inflammatory damage, which then destroys more cells. Then as a result of that, you know, you're going to have to call in the immune cells to infectious inflammatory process going on and also to clean up the damage. So they make their, down, their way down there into the deep mucosal layer and encapsulate foreign material into what's called granulomas. So patients with Crohn's can develop granulomas. Then you have ulcers that eventually form in the GI wall, and these actually extend beyond the submucosa to include the entire wall or transmural. This most commonly affects the ileum and or the colon, particularly the cecum, as I mentioned. So our diagram here, this is the same diagram we looked at with ulcerative colitis. The differences is so you have some pathogens, they make their way past the epithelial layer, then they make their way into the, in the mucosa, then you have these immune cells, you have inflammation, continuing migration of immune cells in here as well. Then you have this cellular debris which forms from destruction of cells, and then you kind of have this encasing here, and this would be representing a granuloma here. Then what happens is you develop an ulcer, and the ulcer continues even deeply into all the layers of the GI wall, so transmural. Now, the difference between this and ulcerative colitis is it's not going to continue one way or the other. What you're going to have is kind of what's called skip lesions, where, you know, maybe a little bit further down, you have a similar type of lesion. So damaged small intestine epithelial cells obviously lead to malabsorption. This definitely includes fat-soluble vitamins and bile. So patients can definitely be deficient in fat-soluble vitamins as well, such as like vitamin D. That wasn't an answer choice, but you always want to consider that. That's very common with patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, they can also be deficient in bile, which bile would help you uh, absorb fat-soluble vitamins. If Crohn's disease is affecting the large intestine, what that can do is damage the epithelial cells of the colon and lead to decreased water absorption, contributing to diarrhea. Symptoms, again, abdominal pain, often in the right lower quadrant, like we see our patient, diarrhea and blood in the stool due to damaged intestinal wall tissue. Treatment, again, you're going to give anti-inflammatory medications and antibiotics to control the gut bacteria and reducing the immune response. For severe symptoms, patients can receive, you know, immunosuppressant therapy, such as corticosteroids. You can consider surgical removal, but it's not as effective as it is for ulcerative colitis. And the problem is, is because you can take one area out, and then you can have another Crohn's effect, another area of the bowel. 
complications are strictures because you can continuously cause inflammation and then that leads to narrowing. You can have fistula formation because you're you're essentially a, uh, the way you can remember that for Crohn's is you're eroding through the entire wall. So then you can you know create these abnormal connections with other organs, develop abscesses, and then also at risk for colorectal cancer. Just chart just gives you a, a good comparison of the two diseases. You know you see this in a lot of different areas, but this is just a, a good review. Age of onset typically younger patients. You know 15 to 40 for both of them. Remember, ulcerative colitis affects the colon and the rectum only. Crohn's can affect anywhere along the GI tract, but commonly affects the ileum and the cecum. Key difference here in the pathogenesis, ulcerative colitis is continuous inflammatory lesions that progress from the rectum and, or distal colon to the proximal colon. Crohn's is these discontinuous patches of gut inflammation. Histologically, ulcerative colitis affects the mucosa and the submucosal layers versus Crohn's affects the entire GI wall. Complications with ulcerative colitis are severe bleeding, toxic megacolon, rupture of bowel, and colon cancer. Crohn's disease, you can have stenosis, abscess formation, fistulas, and colon cancer. And then smoking, this is kind of an interesting thing, and for some reason tests like to ask about it, is that if someone's a smoker, it actually has a, a protective effect in patients with ulcerative colitis, so it can actually uh, dampen their symptoms. Versus Crohn's, if someone's a smoker, it actually aggravates the condition. So if we come back to the answer, so this patient with Crohn's, is most likely to have a deficiency of which of the following. So it's not vitamin A, because vitamin A is a, wa a water-soluble vitamin absorbed in the duodenum. This patient's Crohn's is not affecting the duodenum, at least at this point. If it had affected the duodenum, then, then definitely you could be at risk for that. Same thing with B9, it's absorbed in the duodenum and the jejunum. This patient's Crohn's hasn't affected that. The answer obviously is B12, it's a fat-soluble vitamin absorbed in the ileum. Crohn's disease often affects the ileum and the cecum, as we talked about, and this is very common to see malabsorption of B12 in Crohn's patients. Vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin, but it's absorbed in the duodenum. Uh, so again, it's, uh, the patient's not quite at risk there as well. So again, this is a young patient with new-onset Crohn's disease that's developed an adjacent abscess, as we saw on imaging, and then developed vitamin B12 deficiency due to malabsorption in the ileum. All right, that's all I have for you this time. Be sure to check out all the DaVinci Cases videos available on our YouTube channel and our website, dviacademy.com. The PDF notes for every DaVinci Cases is also available on our website. Also be sure to check out our podcast, The DaVinci Hour, where we interview attendings and residents across medicine to learn more about their experiences, their specialties, and to get their insights on navigating a career in medicine. You can find The DaVinci Hour podcast on our website or any platform where podcasts are found. Lastly, you can find all of our video courses and corresponding outline format books on our website. Don't forget to use the discount code DC20 for 20% off.